When the Russians launched their full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, Howard Buffett realized it would have consequences for the global economy, and in particular, food security globally. So with me is Howard Buffett to explain what the Buffett Foundation is doing to address this. And welcome, Howard. Great. to I know we've got the farm background in common. So yeah. it was one of the first things I thought about, too, because I know like what a breadbasket that area of the world is. And I mean, if you could explain a little bit, I guess, just in general terms, how how did that invasion of Ukraine impact the global f- food supply? Well, one of the things that caught my attention immediately was realizing the level of production that comes out of Ukraine, uh, agricultural production, and then also where a lot of that production goes. And it actually does go to quite a few countries, and a number of those countries are um, either food insecure or very much on the line of being food insecure. So I knew it would have a big impact, and our foundation focuses on both food security and conflict mitigation. So uh, those two are quite evident in, in, the, in when Russia uh, invaded Ukraine. So we wanted to get involved and understand immediately what we could do. And that goes all the way from uh, providing immediate food kits to people on the front line and newly liberated areas, to refugees that are leaving the country, to actually, uh, we've provided a lot of equipment, farm equipment to help both get the harvest out and a lot of the planters are out trying to plant right now. So it really, it covers a whole spectrum. And and then we also support the World Food Program along with USAID and we shipped uh, uh, tens of thousands of tons of, of grain out to refugees in Ethiopia and people in Yemen. So it really spans a pretty broad uh, spectrum. Yeah, well, I remember reading, because Egypt is one of the top buyers of wheat in the world and they don't grow their own. And so they were vulnerable because I think they buy a lot from that area of the world. Well, there, there's an, a number, of, you know, first of all, you, if you back up, you think about um, Ukraine was the number one producer of sunflower oil in the world. Uh, there's something like, t- you know, it changes every year a little bit depending on where production is, but they're the uh, four or five in production of corn, uh, about three in production of wheat, so if you start looking at something like three and barley, so if you if you look at starting to take the production off the table on a global scale, you know, you can't just step in and replace that. I mean, farmers in the United States can't say, well, we're going to step up our production that much. I mean, we're always trying to increase our production. So, you know, you look at what's happening, you know, we're going to have the largest deficit of rice production in 20 years this year. We're going to have uh, some real challenges out of South America. You know, Brazil has a good crop, Argentina doesn't. So how this crop comes out in 2023 in the U.S. is going to have a big impact globally, but primarily because of what's been lost through the Ukraine production. Yeah, well, and I know the Midwest is kind of dry right now, so um, let's hope that the rain comes for those growing areas in Illinois and Indiana and, and Iowa. because the- We need it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, you were just in Ukraine, right? But- I, was there, I was there about six or seven weeks ago. Uh, that was my seventh trip. Um, I'm heading back uh, very soon uh, for my eighth trip. Uh, I'll be going out to the front line, which I have gone to a few times to to really get a clear understanding of what's happening. That's where you see, you know, people that have been living in basements for over a year. You've seen, I, I mean, I have seen a number of villages that have been completely flattened, just completely uh, destroyed. And I, I don't even know how you rebuild something like that. Um, there's, you know, thousands of people that need food. Of course, with the dam that that uh, was destroyed just the two days ago, you know, there's a lot of flooding now down south. That's displaced a lot of people. Um, also, we got reports back where Russians were um, showing additional farm uh, activity. And then I see quite often, I get pictures and stories from people where farmers have hit landmines with their uh, tractors and combines. So, you know, it's just it, it's just this constant, it, it, it's really a war on civilians. And it's just this constant hammering of every aspect of life there is in Ukraine. And the Russians don't play by any rules. Yeah. Well, it's extremely tragic uh, what's happening. And, and you mentioned the dam that was in a main agricultural growing area, I understand. It's it took out uh, there's three areas that it really affects in terms of their irrigation ability. 
and it, it destroyed about 70 or 80 percent of the irrigation in one area, about 60, 70 percent in another, and about 30 percent. So that just, again, reduces production significantly. I mean, you know, uh, th there's only one way you double your yield, uh, especially if you're growing something like corn, and that is irrigation. So, uh, you know, I, I remember, you know, we have irrigation in our farms in Nebraska, and I would grow 70 bushel corn without it. And I've gotten 240 bushel corn with it. So, I mean, you know, you take that kind of irrigation out of the mix and you're going to see another significant drop in production. Mm, and just exactly what we don't need in the world right now is this. So now how do you make sure the money goes where it's needed? I mean, you hear a lot about corruption in these, con you know, in these different countries. And is there, do you have a way of vetting that? Well, there's, there's two things we do. Well, really three uh, you know, we've spent most of our time working in places like Democratic Republic of Congo and Sudan and, uh, you know, Central America, South America. There, there's a, every country we work in has corruption. Uh, Ukraine, of course, has been, uh, has had, has, has dealt with serious issues with corruption coming out of the kind of the Soviet Union era. And so it, it's a very real thing you have to deal with. But uh, Ninety-seven percent of what we've done has either been through a five hundred one c three registered uh, nonprofit with, with the U.S., uh, but even a larger amount of it has been in-kind contributions. For example, we've given about twenty-five million dollars of equipment uh, to the SES, which is doing de uh, humanitarian demining, and so we give that equipment in kind. So you know we're giving them large demining equipment. We're not giving them the money. And um, and of course, we monitor how the equipment is used. Uh, we get those reports, but it, it's much less like, I mean, you know, a demining machine is going to get used for demining. I mean, there's not much else you can do with it. Um, so, you know, we we have very little cash that we've got that we've used uh, in any way in Ukraine. So, you know, between using a 501c3 registered nonprofit in the U.S. Uh, who's operating over there, and uh, using the approach of in-kind contributions rather than cash contributions, we're pretty confident. Uh, and then we follow up on everything. We're, I, I'm 100% confident that everything we've done uh, has been done pretty well so far. Well, I think the world appreciates what you do um, because it's you know just a tragedy and it doesn't feel like it's ending anytime soon. It feels like the Ukraine people are going to be dealing with this for a while, just from my sense of what I read and hear about it. I, I think it's going to go on longer than people would want it to go on. I mean, one of the problems, you know, you, you can give the U.S. and the European allies uh, credit for supporting Ukraine. But what they've done, if you look at the last, you know, 15 months, what they've really done is they've kind of uh, dribbled out this equipment in a way where it keeps Ukraine fighting and a lot of soldiers dying, but it does not give Ukraine the ability to really win the war. And so, you know, we've watched um, the, and I'm not being critical politically of anybody, but, you know, we've watched the, the administration here and, and, and as well as some congressmen and women, but, you know, they, they say, well, we're not going to do this. And then three to four months later, they decide, well, maybe, maybe they need this, we'll do it. Uh, you know, a war is a war. And, and it's not like it's waiting for you to decide what it is that you need. Uh, you know what you need to fight a war. Yeah, well, and it's a difficult situation all the way around and, and tragic and, and unnecessary, really. So, well, Howard, great to hear what the Buffett Foundation is doing. And uh, thank you and, um, you know, for what you're doing over there and for globally for the food supply. Come back, join me on the combine sometime. Oh, I'd love to. They go kind of slow <laughs> for me, though. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you.